listening to Diamond Dave, and uh, he had a video talking about where most America was too stupid to be a criminal. And I started to do some research. The number of people who are getting caught for the PPP fraud, the DED, because, you know, I, I, it got me to thinking. When I was a white collar criminal, I did that for a minute. Let me go ahead and outline the procedures that I took. One of the things that I was definitely afraid of was getting caught. The kid is not built for jail. I'm not built for jail. So I figured out a way to open up a checking account through the mail. And I figured out a way to get that ATM card to an address that I didn't live at. And I figured out a way to get the money out the ATM, like I would just put on a hoodie and I go to the ATM and I put the card in and draw the money out. And I figured out a way to deposit the checks into the bank without going in the branch. Essentially, once the jig was up, because I will tell you what happened, the person that I was um, stealing the money from realized that money was being stolen, so they closed the check and account and moved the money. And one night I went to the ATM and the ATM kept the uh, card. And then I noticed that the mailbox that I was using as the mail drop, the mailbox disappeared. So the jig was up. But what I did was carefully construct an illegal activity that wouldn't come back on me. And I, once again, I don't hang around criminals. I don't know a lot of criminals. Because when I was doing this, I didn't tell nobody. I was dating this girl who sold weed. And you know, she noticed that I had some money and she was just asking me and asking me and asking me and pressing me, what, how did I do it? And I wouldn't tell her. Cause one of the things, and I don't know, I saw it in a movie or read it in a book that when you do something illegal, if you keep it to yourself, you don't tell anyone, you don't bring in co-conspirators, so to speak your chances of getting caught dramatically go down. I remember that. So I wouldn't tell her what I did. I wouldn't tell her how I did it. And six months later, she gets busted for selling weed. And I find out, because I get a call. <laughs> I get a call from the Fulton County Jail at the house phone of all places. Because, uh, you know, someone answered the phone and they, they knocked on my door. It's like, hey, you have a phone call from Fulton County Jail. I was like, what? And it dawned upon me, because this is how a lot of criminals get caught. They bring in other people. Like, it is epidemic how many folks go to jail and they start confessing their crimes to their cellmate. And in the jail system, this is something I know that if you're up on charges and you can give the DA some juicy information, this can reduce the charges that you're facing. So many criminals have gone to jail and told their cellmate what they did. And the cellmate who was facing some critical charges decided to say, ah, uh, Mr. DA, I got some stuff for you. And I, I, I'm looking at, this is the thing that's getting me. I'm looking at the number of people who are getting caught for the PPP, because I didn't get any PPP money. I, I didn't get any of that money. And um, the number of people that created fictitious businesses and created fraudulent documents and like, one of the things, I think this is the one of the 48 laws of power planet to the end. Let me see. Let me let me check that out real quick. Um, 
just give me a little second. All right, law two, never put too much trust in friends. Learn how to use enemies. All right, we're going through it. Just trying to see if that law is in here. Keep your hands clean. Twenty nine plan all the way to the end. That was one of the 48 laws of power. So that's one of the things I did when I created my criminal enterprise. I planned it so I could not get caught. And you would think and literally I sat down and I thought about this for a few weeks and I had a written plan. I had written action steps. I had a written plan. So when the caper went bust, there was no way that they could come get me because the checking account wasn't in my name. The mail address wasn't the place I lived at. And I just took money out of the ATM. And also I was very, very conscious of risk. You can call this risk management. And I almost, because one of my limitations was I can only get $500 out the bank at a time in a 24 hour period. Now I could have got more money if I had created a fake ID and actually went in the bank and tried to withdraw the money. And that's something that I um, went back and forth with myself, but at the end, I decided not to do it because the risk was too high. Because I don't know if you've ever been in the bank and this happened after I committed the capers many, many years ago. I was in the bank and there was a young lady who was trying to cash a check. And then the teller just said, hold on a minute, we've got to do some additional verification. Four minutes later, the police showed up and this young lady was led out the bank in handcuffs. And I was like, see that, that's that right there. Cause essentially, um, one of the things is a lot of banks have fraud detection measures in place. Like give you an example, creating a fake pay stub is one of the worst things you can do when trying to get an additional a loan from a credit union or a bank. If you're dealing with someone that's gonna ask for pay stubs and there's numerous things online that creates fake pay stubs. Well, guess what? The banks have all of the formats of all of the pay processors. So if you submit a fraudulent pay stub, they're going to know instantly that it's fake. I had a client who actually did that. Uh, he, he made good money, but he did not have proof of income because he was self-employed and he made um, one of these fraudulent pay stubs and he applied it for the bank and the bank completely shut his account down. They shut down his checking account. They didn't give him the loan. And he was like, what happened? And I told him that all of these banks from ADP to Gusto, they know what their pay um, forms look like. And this is how you got caught. And he was like, oh snap, I didn't know that. See, here's the world that we live in. And I did this in the nineties, right? The banks, the fraud detection countermeasures in place are so good that you don't know what you're dealing with. And this is how all of these people who created these fraudulent documents, because essentially when they deployed the CARES Act, they just put it out there. They just put it out there. There wasn't a lot of verification. There wasn't a lot of checking and stuff. They just put it out there. And this is one of the reasons that so many people were able to commit this fraud. And I remember I was banking at PNC at the time. And I remember one of my bankers, 
was telling me that the number of people who were coming in and establishing business checking accounts, it was just like, she said, we're literally overwhelmed because these people knew that they were able to commit fraud because you, you had to have a business checking account. You had to have an LLC to receive the money. Now, I don't know if they checked the origination date of the LLC because that's on every Secretary of State's website when, when you form the LLC. I don't think they checked because a lot of people were creating instant, instant LLCs and just going ahead and creating these fraudulent documents. And it got me to thinking, what is the end goal and what's, what's in, the, in the law 29 plan to the end? These people are not doing that. Um, going back to what Diamond Dave says that the average person is too stupid to be a criminal. And I really thought about that because, you know, I had a lot of people who really got mad at me because when I divorced this, because I did it once, I never did it again. And it was like, you had the head start and all this other stuff. And the, the uh, you know, and also the way that that was set up, once again, to risk management, I already had everything set up for that caper to do any more because I never really thought about it because I, I felt so bad and I didn't do it again, but I never really thought about it until I decided to do this video. I would have had to exponentially increase my risk to get more material to create more crimes. And this, this is why I was so scared of getting caught. Cause like I said, I'm not built for jail. You know, I don't care if you think I'm a punk. I really don't care. I am not doing that jail life. I was watching the uh, Netflix special inventing Anna, this uh, Russian chick who fooled all these sophisticated New York bankers and lawyers and stuff and almost got a $40 million loan. And I was looking at her and that whole thing with jail, you, you, you're in jail, the lights don't go out, there's always a light on. I'm a person, I cannot sleep with lights on, I can't. So. It, it would just have been a terrible, terrible, terrible situation for Glenn and Cameron to go to jail. Terrible, terrible situation. And, you know, I just looked at that and that big fear, that was a, a huge fear of mine of going to jail, is one of the reasons that I took all of these risk management measures never showing my face, never going into the bank, doing things through the mail. So I had created a buffer zone where I wasn't going to get caught. And also, once again, I only had enough material for that caper. And I started to think, how do criminals get stuff? And this, this is where the risk starts to get higher because once you reach out into bringing other people into the enterprise, that's risky. Because all it takes, like this girl that was dating, I know she would have turned me in to get a, you know get her charges reduced. I know she was like, hey, I know someone that committed this crime. I know she would have narked on me. And that's one of the things that, um, I, I operated as a lone wolf. I did it by myself. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't brag to anyone. I just pretty much kept my activities to myself. And once again, to the people who committed these PPP loan frauds, they were doing all kinds of stuff. Here you are, you are broke dick Danny, and the next day there's a Ferrari in your driveway. Once again, to credit to Diamond Dave, because here's the thing, there's what's typical and there's what's atypical. So if I was gonna commit any PPP law, and I, I will tell you how I would've did it. I would've created proxies. Once again, fictitious documents. I would've created fake aliases. I would have found a social security number of someone else, 
because all this was done through the mail. They never saw anyone. And, but it gets risky because you have to open up that business checking account. Well, actually that's not true. In this environment, you can open up business checking accounts through the internet. So I would have found a proxy. I would have, because here's the thing. When you create an EIN, that comes off of your social. So the Internal Revenue Service, it's an easy track back to, oh, this company was created by so-and-so and and this EIN came off of such and such social security number. So this is one of the reasons these people are getting caught. They left so many breadcrumbs that went back to the, there was no risk management practices whatsoever put in play. They just went ahead and created fraudulent documents, a mixture of fraudulent documents and a mixture of real documents. These EINs came off their social. This is how they know who to come get. So I would have created a proxy because once again, uh, there was a, these laws came after the last great recession know your customers bankers like uh recently i just got a thirty thousand dollar no credit check loan they did not do a hard pull on my credit report but they did do a soft pull because this is part of knowing who you're dealing with they had to verify that i was a real person real person and i I can go ahead and give you the verification they go do the soft credit check and they look at the address on the credit report. And if the address is the same address that I put in for the application, which it was, then this was uh, green lights, green lights, green lights, pass, pass, pass. But I guarantee you, if I had put in a different address, that would have been a problem and they would have asked me for more documentation. Because see, one of the reasons that these people are getting caught is they didn't know what they were dealing with. Because once again, when you create an EIN, it comes off your social. So they they actually can go back and it's like, okay, this social was issued to such and such. And they can start checking your credit profile and they're checking addresses. Some of these people were shocked when the police came and knocked on their door. It's like, how'd you find me? It was quite easy. And once again, shout out to Diamond Dave because I never thought that like i said i did my criminal act enterprises and i stopped doing it so i never really thought uh i never really thought of engaging in conversations engaging with um I never took it past that caper. I never involved in any other criminal activity because the one time I did the research, like I could have got a fake ID, but once again, today they have templates of every ID in America. So if you submit a fake ID, there's a good chance they're gonna know that it's fake. Back then, I think I could have got away with it, but once again, this would have expanded my risk. Going in the bank, and every time you go to the bank and you're at the counter and you do a transaction, that transaction, they, they're recording you. There's a camera on you when you're at the teller window. And it's all digital now. Let's say you did a transaction six years ago and they know the date and time you did the transaction. They can go in their computer and find that video from six years ago. So it's very sophisticated, it's very properly archived, and you, once you walk in that bank or that credit union, and you go to that window and you conduct a transaction, you are recorded. They got your face, they got your height, weight, all that stuff, they got all that. And what I feel Cause you know, once again, I'm a nerd. And that's one of the reasons I know this stuff. I'm a nerd. Um, I spend time researching things that average person couldn't care about. Uh, when I had my child support issues, I would go down to the Fulton County court and watch proceed- proceedings. So I knew what to expect. 
I was telling a friend, he said, most folks ain't even gonna do that. They ain't even gonna think to do that because real life court is very different than TV court. It's very, very different. And I see why so many people are getting caught. Number one, disregard for risk management. How can I do this and not get caught? They don't do that. They just do whatever they want to do with little regard for tomorrow. Like I was listening to, um, my girlfriend was telling me a story. They hired this guy and this guy actually tried to kidnap a woman off North Georgia Hills. All right. I want you to think about the thought process. Guys like see a girl. Oh yeah, she's cute. I'm just going to pick her up. Um, this girl is not going to be happy with you. And if she has family, people will go looking for her. This whole of this whole thing of conducting an act with little regard to the future. Once again, there's no risk management whatsoever. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Um, JT pocket watching. Like he, he's got this series where there is these people teaching people how to commit financial fraud and what's going to happen in the future is you're going to get nailed and you're going to go to jail because there, there's so many laws like wire fraud. If you submit a fake document to a bank, you've just committed wire fraud. So you've got wire fraud, um, and they, they will, you know, this whole thing, um, him 500 is telling people to go on car gurus, get an EIN and go to Navy federal and say, you want this car, get the check. Don't pick up the car and, um, and just lie to the bank. And it doesn't seem the way that they make it sound like it's no big deal. And there was another guy, Mr. Get that money. He does wholesale Asian guy talking about wholesaling, um, lie to the bank, get a mortgage and say, you're going to live in that house. And then, um, don't live in that house and turn it into a rental to get that low interest rate. I know someone who did that and the bank found out in the bank went after him. He got two and a half years in jail for, you know, cause of what they considered it was, um, they considered it mortgage fraud because he actually got a mortgage under the concept of he was going to live in that house. He never lived in that house and somehow the bank got wind of it. Um, once again, narcs are everywhere. There's someone waiting to tell on you at every twist and turn. Like these people who, um, do you understand that if you turn someone in to the internal revenue service, there's a 10% bonus penalty for you, whatever you get 10% of whatever the internal revenue service collects from this person. A lot of, po a lot of people don't know that. So there, there's literally narcs at every twist and turn in every corner. And this is one of the reasons that I feel there are super smart people and there are super smart criminals. Now the super smart criminals actually work very, very hard. And this is why they're successful. So in the public sector and the private sector, smart people win. And in the criminal sector, smart people win. Uh, inventing Anna, she almost pulled it off. The thing that tripped her up was the bank had to do a visual verification of proof of her trust fund, which didn't exist. And that was the only reason she didn't get that $40 million loan. She was that close, that close. Uh, and the chick who uh, was Anna Delvey, was extremely smart. 
She just didn't have all of the pieces to her scam because if she could have actually pretended to be someone who actually had a real trust fund, she could have, she could have pulled it off because here's one of the things going with my, um, eBay loan, you know, that video is on B school for hustlers. They asked me for a lot of information. They asked me for my tax forms. They asked me for my checking account. They asked me for a utility bill. See, going forward, it's going to be real hard. Like all of the people who pulled off this PPP fraud going forward, it's going to be impossible to do in the future because they are like, okay, this is where they got in. This is how they did it. We didn't check this. It's going to be impossible. And this is why so many people are getting caught. Like, uh, the real estate trapper has been doing these videos. Like I was going to do credit repair and I actually, actually got 20 people fix their credit and realized I didn't want to be involved in that business. Good thing. They're starting to go after these credit repair agencies. There was a guy here on YouTube called the credit game. His YouTube channel is gone. He's under federal indictment, federal indictment. So I'm really glad that I didn't do the, uh, credit repair thing. Uh, I'm so glad that I didn't do it. Um, but they're cracking down on credit repair. Uh, this guy, this guy, he, he has a cooking show. He was doing credit repair in the state of Georgia. He got $140,000 fine. So what you're going to find going forward that a lot of these so-called easy scams are going to be so hard to pull off in the future because of the access of data and the safeguards that they're putting in place. But most of these PPP fraud loan people are going to, uh, they're getting caught because like the thing is you living in a trailer and then you, you rob a bank and the next thing you know, park outside the trailer is a brand new Dodge Hellcat. <laughs> I mean, people do this stuff. People do this stuff. I remember, and this wasn't, um, any fraud. I remember when I was living in West End and this girl's grandmother died and left her like $400,000. Did she lose, move out the hood? No, she bought a brand new BMW. Her and her drug dealer boyfriend was like living the life, taking trips and stuff. I think she went through that money in like six months. So with the PPP fraud and every day, there's like someone else who's getting caught up. They're finding out because they're going through their records. They're finding out these people having cosmetic surgery they're buying jewelry, they're buying cars, they're buying houses. And this is something else. Uh, because the money is electronically deposited, it kind of gets around this, you know, if you go try to buy a house in cash and you cannot prove that you had that cash in your bank account and you, not, you cannot prove that you earned that money legally, they may not sell you that house. Seriously, you, you, you let's say you find you, you're out walking and you find one point five million dollars in cash. You're going to have a hard time trying to put that money in the bank, because if you walk to the bank and you're like, hey, I got one point five million, you want to put that in your checking account? I guarantee you someone's going to be knocking on your door. Cause it's just not normal for someone to come in and put $1.5 million cash in the bank. It's just not normal. And you will find it. Cause like I was watching this show, dirty money and the drug dealers have a problem cause they have so much cash that they were going to Peru and they were buying this illegal gold. It was drug money buying illegal gold. And then they were selling this gold. And once they sold this gold, then they got, a transfer from a refinery that cleaned the money up because the bank on, because here's the thing, banks do not really question wire transfers because it's just not normal for someone to be sending a business X amount of dollars for fraudulent. It's just not normal. 
wire transfers are real cash, so banks do not scrutinize wire transfers the way that they scrutinize cash. So once again, these the, well, the smart criminals, smart criminals, you, you go ahead and you look at um, the people who plan to the end. And the average criminal doesn't plan to the end. The average criminal just does stuff with little regard to the future. And this is why I think so many people get caught. So many people get caught because they don't understand the systems of checks and balances. They don't understand that when you do something, you're being scrutinized. And, you know, the reason I didn't get caught was I planned it to the end. And like, like I said, I, I've, I've, I know, cause like I said, I was doing it and I wasn't going to keep doing it. So I didn't think about the future because the only thing that I was thinking about is you keep doing this, you're going to get caught. That was my big fear. You was going to get caught. And I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm, I'm not going to jail. I'm just not. Yeah, I'm broke. Yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah, I need money, but I'm not going to jail. And that, that big fear kept me from doing more because, man, the stuff that I was looking at, and you know what's funny? And I wouldn't do it, but you could steal $2 million and get two years in jail. A lot of people would make that exchange. Two years for two million? Hell yeah. Because it's going to take me 40 years of working to make two million. So if I can sit down for two years and get this money, yeah, I, that's an easy calculation for a lot of people because they're so broke. For me, I wouldn't do it. I would not sit down for two million for two years. There's, there's no way I would do that. But I'm in a different uh, situation. I have the ability to make that money. So for me, I wouldn't do it. It's just not worth it for me. But once again, to the average person who's broke, who's desperate, who's struggling, they might make that exchange. So for the average person who's going to commit crime, the chances of them getting caught are so great. They're so um, over the top likely. And once again, you see all these people who are doing this stuff, because as we go through this great reset, as we go through the global reset, as we go through the recession, you're gonna have more and more people committing crimes. And what I feel is the petty crimes, the nonviolent crimes, they're gonna kinda ignore those because no one got hurt. You know, you commit a crime where you don't pull a gun on someone. Now the violent crimes, that's where all the attention is going to go. That's where the jail sentence is going to go. So I feel at some point in America, you're going to be able to commit a bunch of little petty crimes and not much is going to happen to you because these petty crimes, you're not really getting that much money. But yeah, um, like I said, you know, if I was going to do the PPP thing, I would have had a proxy. I would have never did any of that stuff off of my original information. And I knew that because, you know, I know the laws, know your customer, know who you're dealing with. And you know, what I probably would have did if I was going to do the PPP fraud is straight up, I would have went to I-20 and I would have found one of those people who's living under a bridge. And I would have said, uh, cause once again, he's homeless living under a bridge. So he doesn't have a permanent address. So it's going to be very hard for them to find it. And I'll say, look, I need to use your identity. I give you $500. If you give me your social security number, now, a lot of people were like what you need, they would have given, they would have gave it to me. So I would have used that social security number. I would have got a new EIN and then I would have created a fictitious company under that EIN. Then I would have went in as quote, the manager, <laughs> I would have opened an online bank account. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't went into a physical branch. I would have opened an online bank account. 
and then I would have filed the fraudulent documents because at this point, everything's apart from me. The social, the identity, the EIN, you know, because all this stuff you can do online. You can go ahead and get your EIN, you can go ahead and get your LLC, you can go ahead and get your business banking account, then create these fraudulent documents. So when it went boom, they couldn't get me. And the homeless guy, since he's homeless, he doesn't have a, a address, they couldn't get him. So that's what I would have did if I was going to do this PP fraud. Because once again, understand how the system operates. These laws, know your customer. Um, and I had a friend who worked for SunTrust in the, the compliance department. There's all kinds of things that banks have to deal with from the compliance side. So, yeah. But the average person, from an intellectual standpoint, doesn't understand what they have to go through to create a fictitious alias to get away with white collar crime or any kind of crime. So yeah, I, I believe Diamond Dave is 100% correct because the number of people who are getting caught, some of it's laziness because it, it, it ain't really that complicated for you to create an alias apart from you to create a proxy. But most people don't know what they're dealing with. They have no clue to what they're doing once they start to file these false documents, start to lie to banks, start to uh, conduct transactions over the internet, committing wire fraud. They have no clue, no clue whatsoever.